Hello and welcome to NHM Live. I'm Alison, I'm your host. And for today's episode, we're asking where on earth our scientists go exploring and what's left to discover. This year marks the 250th anniversary of Cook's Endeavour voyage across the Pacific. Now this was the first expedition devoted to scientific discovery. Today, it's easy to imagine that everywhere is explored and there's very little left to discover, but that is absolutely not the case. And there's one environment in particular that we're interested in, and that's the deep sea. So today, we're meeting some of our scientists that have been exploring this uncharted territory. Now, we are, of course, live here in the studio, and we would love to hear from you, our audience. So please, please don't be shy. If you have any questions or comments at all during the stream, post those to us, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. But let me introduce you to our speakers. I'm joined today by Adrian and Amber. Thank you so much for joining us. Tell us, first of all, what you do at the museum, Adrian. Well, th <coughs> thank you, Alison. Yeah, I'm a research scientist here in the Darwin Centre. Um, and really, I guess I'm a marine biologist, and I study my favourite area of the, of the world, which is the deep ocean, uh, really unexplored. So a great topic for exploration. Absolutely. And Amber? So I'm a PhD researcher here at the Natural History Museum. Adrian's my, my boss, my supervisor, and I'm studying the environmental impacts that a new industry of deep seabed mining might have on the ecosystems that live in our deep ocean. So fascinating subjects, and you are both obviously well used to expeditions on the high seas. Where are some of the places that you get to go? So we are, we're really fortunate, actually. We work um, on the, uh, in collaboration with these major oceanographic institutes, uh, going out on big ships, uh, out into the high seas. I've been recently to the Antarctic, uh, to the Central Pacific, and to the Caribbean Sea. Sounds quite nice. Uh, but it's a really amazing experience going out to sea on these big research boats, uh, sampling areas which we've never seen before. And Amber's also had that uh, excitement of going out to sea, haven't you, as well? It's a really amazing experience. Yeah. yeah, I have, yeah. So I've stayed a little bit closer to home so far. I've been uh, in UK waters and just outside of UK waters into international waters, um, probably about a three to five day transit out, so still quite far from, from the UK uh, land, but we were specifically looking at seamounts that we have in our waters, and actually in UK waters, in, in the cold water, we have uh, corals, which most people don't know. Most people think oh. that they're in only tropical environments, but we have deep sea cold water corals that are found at up to 2,000 metres depth in, in the UK waters mm. that need protecting as well. Wow. So there are there are so many fascinating environments in the deep sea, aren't there? But the, the one we're focusing on today is, is the hydrothermal vents, uh, which if our viewers don't know, um, Amber, can you explain what exactly are they and where do we find them? Yeah, so hydrothermal vents, um, they sound complicated, but they're not, they're not that bad. They <laughs> are where cold water from the bottom of our oceans, which is generally about two or three degrees centigrade, will get into weaknesses and cracks in the oceanic crusts. And when it, when it gets into the crust, it sinks lower and lower and gets closer to magma. And as we know, magma is hot, and so it heats up the water. And as it heats up the water, it catalyzes reactions, which means that reactions can happen that wouldn't have been able to happen in lower temperatures. And this causes metals and minerals to come out of the rocks and into the water. And then as the water heats, again, as we know, heat rises. And so the hot water with all this mineral rich uh, fluid in it will rise back out of the oceanic crust and as it forces out, this water can be up to 400 degrees centigrade. And then it meets the two degrees centigrade water, and that's where we get it precipitating out. So all of these particles that are rich in minerals and metals will 
form these amazing chimneys that we can see here on the screen. Oh, they're, they're fantastic structures and, and they, they, they get quite big. Yeah, they can. You, we've seen ones 30 metres high. Um, you can get small ones, big ones, a whole variety. And we're definitely, I think, going to find, find bigger ones. I mean, there's so many that we haven't found yet um, that we know we will one day. And Adrian, they're, a, they're a, a recent discovery relatively, aren't they? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, so the, the study of deep sea hydrothermal vents is a relatively young science. So if you go only back to the mid-1970s, we had no idea that these things existed. We had clues. Uh, and it's, it's a really amazing discovery, the actual the, the, the story of how it happened. So chemists and geologists had a kind of suspicion in the 1970s that around our spreading centres, the mid-ocean ridges, like famously the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, for example, uh, that chain of underwater mountains that stretches down the Atlantic, there would be areas where there was seafloor hydrothermalism, mm. uh, hot water, as Amber's very uh, brilliantly explained, emanating out of the Earth's crust. Uh, they had no concept whatsoever that it might be biologically interesting. So when they went on the first expedition, which is actually uh, with the amazing, the US Navy built submersible Alvin, a little tiny human-occupied submersible vehicle, we'll talk a bit now about those later, uh, went down to this vent site on the Galapagos Rift in the East Pacific. Um, and there was only geologists uh, and chemists on the ship, and just, uh, just a couple of geologists in, in the actual Alvin submersible. And uh, they got there, and to their absolute astonishment, they discovered that, well, not only they, they were excited to find hydrothermal vents, finally, <laughs> see what they predicted would exist in the deep sea, but they were covered in life. And not just a sort of small deep sea life that people already known about, these giant tube worms with feathery plumes, these big clams, these crabs, giant crabs crawling all over them. Uh, completely amazing. And uh, they were astonished. And the, famous, the most famous sort of uh, anecdote is that on that first expedition in 77, they had no idea how to preserve the animals because there were no biologists on board. They had to get, raid the ship's bar uh, <laughs> to get bottles of vodka to preserve the very first hydrothermal uh, vent life, which was really pivotal moment in our understanding of biology of our oceans, if not one of the major biological discoveries of all time. Thankfully um, yeah, they so had vodka on board. That's right, <laughs> yes. yeah. No, it's an ama amazing story. And, uh, uh, and so that was in only in the late 1970s, and it really launched a whole kind of period of, of exploration of our oceans. I mean, we had known that life exists in the deep sea before that, mm. and actually quite high diversity in many places. Uh, but no one predicted that these such weird and bizarre animals were, could be there. We brought a few with us today as well, so we can... Absolutely. Can, can we take a look? Well, I, mean, well, I mentioned worms, and uh, you know, I am a bit of a worm fan. <laughs> um, as, uh, you know, anyone who's been to previous shows, Nature Live shows, will be so I brought these along. Uh, these are the, I mentioned the giant ones. I mean, these are pretty big uh, for a deep-sea animal, bearing in mind that until... Uh, so here's, these are deep-sea hydrothermal vent tube worms. Before hydrothermal vents were found, um, most deep sea animals are sort of millimetres to a few centimetres in size. So when they found animals of this size, and even the bigger ones, which I couldn't bring down because you wouldn't be able to see us because they'd be so big, uh, it was really an, an amazing moment. They found these weird animals. Okay, then the first question was, how on earth did they get their food? How do they survive? And, uh, and they have this bizarre anatomy. They have inside the body of the worm, there's no mouth, there's no gut. Uh, they're just a, a tubular... A uh, worm-like animal, extremely distantly related to earthworms on land. They're part of the same phylum, the annelids. Uh, but they're stuffed full of bacteria. Uh, and Amber mentioned earlier, exp explaining about the fluids which are coming out, precipitating out, and you saw on the screens, mm -hmm. those black smoker fluids are full of chemicals, in particular chemicals called sulphide or hydrogen sulphide. Uh, and the bacteria inside these worms uh, can get all of their energy uh, from that sulphide. And you can see it, I think, on the screen, there's a picture of one of them dissected out. It's actually, it's actually one of these specimens. Mm. Uh, and uh, gain all of their energy from utilising that chemical coming out of the Earth's crust. So it was a re revolutionary discovery, because we realised that large, complex, multicellular life could exist uh, w effectively without uh, the need for the sun's energy. Uh, really amazing moment. Absolutely. We've got a few other things here it's as well. It's not just worms, is it? We've got all sorts so of Amber, worms. tell them about this the kiwi crabs. We yeah. love kiwi crabs. Yeah, so here we've got <laughs> the kiwi crab. Yeah. Professor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> professor taught me in his, in his last year of teaching, so I'm very proud to have had Paul Tyler teaching me we as named well, it, the yeah, namesake. Kiwa, yeah. kiwi Tyler, I, yes. after a professor oh. in the University of Southampton, uh, and uh, uh, who taught both me and Amber, actually, yeah. uh, during <laughs> our time there, many years, well, me many years ago. Uh, so, yeah, this is uh, kiwi Tyler, yeah, so the amazing thing um, about the kiwa crabs, they're also called yeti crabs. And the reason they're called yeti crabs is, if you can maybe see on this, is that um, they have lots of what we call setae, so hairs, on their arms and on their chests. And people were very confused why they had these. And um, when they first saw them uh, on videos from the deep sea, they saw that they were waving their arms about a lot in the air. 
and their counterparts in shallower water, um, you know, crabs and lobsters in shallower water can be quite territorial. So at first they thought maybe it was aggression because they can, marking out their territory, because mm. they can be found in aggregations of 750 per metre squared. Um, and so they thought, you know, maybe that's why they were doing it. Turns out they weren't when we brought them up to the surface um, about six years ago. And on the video, you could see they had these amazing specialised mouth parts combing their chest and arm hairs. And we assumed they weren't just preening themselves to make themselves look pretty. And what we actually saw they were doing was they were taking these chemosynthetic bacteria. So what Adrian was talking about, these chemicals, chemo meaning chemical, synthetic is to make. So they're making energy from the chemicals that are in the fluids coming out from the oceanic crust. They incorporate them onto their chest hair and their arm hair. And they basically have an arm farm and a chest <laughs> farm. And when they're waving their arms in the air, they're waving it into the hot fluid that's got more of the uh, chemical compounds they need and essentially fertilising their arm farms and then using mouth parts to comb bacteria yeah, yeah. off their own chest and arms is, to be able to brilliant. sustain their own life. So it's quite amazing. As I was thinking, I've got quite hairy arms. <laughs> yeah, I could just lick my arms for gain sustenance for uh, yeah, my, sure my dinner. I'm not sure it would work on no, no, I know, quite, I know. You never know, evolution works in amazing ways. Worth a ways. try, worth yeah, a try. That, <laughs> Amber's example, of course, shows just how amazing and novel some of the adaptations of life mm. is in these hydrothermal systems and how we're learning so much about general biology there. Ah, yes, and we've, we've actually got some, some questions from our viewers oh, on yeah. Facebook. Um, so we've got Ibrahimi on Facebook asking, how deep are you guys searching for life? So how deep are we talking here? So it's a really good question. And uh, so the typically hydrothermal vents occur along spreading centres, mid-ocean ridges. I mentioned the mid-Atlantic ridge. So depths of 1,000 to 3,000 metres. We have actually been, I think some of the video that we had up there was mm. from a depth of 5,000 metres, wow. actually. The deepest known hydrothermal vents, which I was lucky enough to go on an expedition to. Yeah, amazing. Uh, but typically it's two to 3,000, but that's still mm. extraordinarily deep. Uh, it is, so it is. if you imagine you can only snorkel down to a few metres uh, comfortably before you start to get pressure on mm. your mask and things like that, and you can only scuba dive to 50 to 100 metres. So we're talking about extreme depths. And, um, uh, but a very quite a, a widespread environment. Of course, the deep sea mm. is a huge area, uh, and there's a lot of that uh, depth out there. And another question f uh, from Pippa on Facebook: How do the creatures find the vents if they can't survive without them? Which is a brilliant question. Very good question. Do you want to have a go? <laughs> 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 have a go, but fundamentally, we don't 100% know. Yeah. Um, yeah, really if you imagine what what we need to know is a lot of these invertebrates they come in a larval form first of all. So a baby crab doesn't look like a baby crab. Mm. It's it's a, a zooplankton and they're very, very microscopic. And so you imagine going down about 5,000 metres, so five kilometres below the ocean surface, and you've got a net, and you've got to catch these plankton to find out what they're doing and how they're sensing their environment. I mean, it's impossible. It's mm. more difficult than finding a needle in a haystack. So mm. we have minimal data on it. But I mean, we're assuming they're um, able to just pick up the chemical signals. So the way that we find hydrothermal vents as scientists is you can tow instruments that picks up on different chemical signals in the water and then when that changes slightly you might find more iron in it you might find more sulfide in it that's when we know to go down and explore mm. more yeah. um, so presumably there's animals doing yeah. those same things but they're in larval form we can't catch them it's really dark it's high pressure mm. it's not easy so we haven't yeah. fully got the answers yet excellent question guys keep them coming yeah, um, now you mentioned this this just changed our understanding of, of life on earth obviously do we know how life evolved at these vents what's the oldest um, system that we know of well, it's, a, it's a really it's a really interesting thing so when they first found hydrothermal vent fauna like these big tube worms actually the scientists at the time this is only not that long ago this is in, in the 1980s thought well maybe they're actually really ancient lineages of life that have been there since uh, hydrothermal vents first arose mm. Uh, but subsequently, it, it turns out, um, and we've been doing research and we've been going back in time, looking into the fossil record of hydrothermal vent animals that have been preserved in the fossil record. And you can go back actually over 400 million years back and find <sighs> hydrothermal vent deposits. Famous one would be the island of Cyprus, actually. Uh, Cyprus is actually a giant old hydrothermal vent, most of it. It's one of the reasons it's a big copper mine. And we might come to that later, and we might talk a little bit about the, the mineral resources at vents. Uh, and you go to these sites and you find tube worms. Uh, but interestingly, what we're finding is that we don't think uh, that the tube worms and the things we see today have actually had that very long history. We think repeatedly over evolutionary time, the, the general fauna, the general animals living in the background deep sea or in our shallow waters have been able to recolonize vents really rapidly. Uh, so it's quite a discovery. And, and together with colleagues in the museum, we're, we're now working on a, a project uh, funded by the Natural Environment Research Council to look into just that. Uh, to actually see if uh, we've got the possibility that uh, life has repeatedly colonised these systems. 
So yeah, that was really oh. interesting. And could this be where life first evolved on Earth? Is, is, is that one theory? Well, so we know if we go back to uh, very early evolution of life, it's, it's a good hypothesis that 3.8 billion years ago, the very early bacterial life on our planet was uh, microbial mm. at hydrothermal systems. But it took a very, very long time after that before uh, we got to the stage where uh, uh, large, complex, multicellular life could actually colonise that. And that's what we're trying to work on. What was that trigger that allowed that to happen in the, uh, that, uh, that long ago? Really yeah. amazing, yeah. yeah. It's fascinating stuff. I absolutely love it. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, of course, these are incredibly difficult environments to actually get to. How much do we know about the, the bottom of the ocean? How much of it have we actually mapped? Depends by what you mean by mapped or kind of explored or unexplored. It's all quite subjective. Uh, to someone who just wants to know where the bottom of the ocean goes up and down, so your mountains and your, mm. and your trenches, then technically we know about 100% of um, our deep oceans because from satellites you can use radar and it measures the peaks and troughs um, where the top of the ocean is actually being pushed up and down due to changes in gravity um, by the mountains and the trenches below so we can get these really sensitive measurements up to about five kilometers resolution for a hundred percent of our planet so to some people who were just interested in knowing that they'd say well we've mapped and explored a hundred percent of the planet um, of the ocean on the planet um, but that's to five kilometers resolution and resolution means the accuracy and mm. the precision of those measurements and so if there was um, something five kilometers across which to me is quite large like a big mountain or something underneath the ocean we would have missed that mm. so that's when we move on to some of the equipment that adrian's going to talk about in a minute um, we've got some autonomous underwater vehicles called auv so people don't have to control them at all and remotely operated vehicles which are rovs which people aren't in but you uh use them basically on a, on a joystick like a, a gaming console but much more fancy um, and you also have manned submersibles as well but we don't use those so much in the uk um, but yeah, they're, they're absolutely incredible and the reason is they can use acoustics and sound can travel through water, mm. unlike radar used yep. by the satellites. And so we can get a much finer resolution and beautiful maps and they have cameras on as well. Um, and so that means we can actually see what lives there, we can sample mm. what lives there and to, to me, and I think a lot of people, that would be explored. Mm. And yeah. of our ocean, we've done about, well, much less than 0.01% mm. to that level. So to me, it's unexplored. Um, I think to most people, mm. we think it was completely unexplored, really, yeah. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned that the use of submersibles back in the mid 1970s and the first discovery, which is obviously incredibly important because they've got eyes down there, people could see mm. what was happening. But prior to that, most deep sea exploration was from dredges or trawls or just lowering things blind to see what you might bring up. Uh, and that was revolutionary. But of course, deep ocean submersibles, it can go to several thousand meters and do things that are extremely rare. There's only two or three in the world that can actually do that. Uh, uh, so nowadays we're using these remotely operated vehicles that Anna mentioned, which bring live imagery from the seafloor. And I think there's some nice images coming up on the screen there um, of, of one that can actually dive. One we have down in the National Geography Centre in Southampton that can dive to six and a half thousand metres. Uh, we've been on seven, both of us have been on expeditions with that, where you've got live imagery from the seafloor up to the ship. You can control the sampling, and everyone can get a, a really amazing first-hand experience of that environment. So it's really revolutionary. Um, so uh, it changing everything that be, we can do. It must be so amazing to see. How easy are they to, to operate? So is it like a, a joystick? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, uh, Amber mentioned it's a bit, so if, you're, if you're good at computer games, it's not a bad <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, skill to have actually, which is sort of three-dimensional spatial awareness skill, because uh, you're flying around and using a lot of different instruments to sort of understand the position. But the one thing about ROVs, of course, is they're tethered to the surface mm. ship. Uh, so you're, t you're pulling a tether around, a bit like when you're vacuuming your house uh, and you've got a long cable. Uh, it gets a bit tangled on things, so that's very typical. And we have a small ROV, which I, I mean, I, Amber and I pilot it. Um, uh, but when they get to a larger size, you need a whole team of expert technicians to do it. So, you know, it's an, it's an expensive business, but incredibly uh, incredible technology for us to use. Yeah, absolutely amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, guys, if you've just joined us, we're exploring the deep ocean with our scientists, Adrian um, and Amber. If you've got any questions for our scientists, do post them and we'll, we'll answer as many as we can. Um, now, Adrian, you mentioned that the, there are minerals deposited uh, at, the, at these vents and in the deep ocean, and that's something you're really interested in, in yeah. Amber. Yeah. Uh, why is that? They're, they're of interest to industry, is that right? They are, yeah. So the ones that specifically at hydrothermal vents that are of interest are copper, and zinc and gold and silver. 
um, and it's all very geopolitical. Some of them are found in people's what you call exclusive economic zones, so the zones of waters that countries own themselves, but most of them are found in international waters, which is why it's a little bit more contentious and more geopolitical, because you, you can't own the waters mm. and the seabed in international waters, and so mining them has started a big thing at the, at the UN, really. Yeah. And are there plans to, to mine these environments? There are. There's about 29 or 30 um, exploration licenses currently um, sold by a UN sister organisation called the International Seabed Authority. Uh, and their mandate is to regulate activities that are happening on the seabed regarding deep seabed mining and also to ensure uh, that they are environmentally sound as well. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of exploration licenses out there at the moment, of which the UK has two. Um, but it's not necessarily going to happen very soon in international waters because not all of the laws have been written yet. So there, there will be laws to presumably protect this environment? Yeah, so the uh, International Seabed Authority, I'm going to say ISA yeah. after that point. They've currently written the ones for exploration and okay. prospecting. So that means you can go out and you can have a look and you can take up some samples in your license area, but you can't do anything of commercial scale. The exploration uh, regulations are due to be released and finished by 2020 mm. by them. And until that point, nobody can actually do deep sea bed mining in international waters. But we are expecting that some of what we call the pioneer investors, the early movers that have been looking at this since the 1960s, will probably move quite quickly after mm. 19, uh, 1920, 2020 um, to be able to start deep sea bed mining. Wow, and that's likely to have an impact on, on whatever's down there. Very much so, yes. Yeah. So. Um, it's difficult to say what the impacts will be because mining's never happened. Um, but you know, you've got a lot of squidgy animals on the deep seabed, and presumably a, a 300-ton mining vehicle will have an impact on on these animals, um, whether it's mechanically moving over them. Uh, but also, one of the things that we look at is the plume, and this could have a much larger scale impact than just squashing some animals on the seafloor. You've got um, the plume where the vehicle moves along and kicks up a sediment plume behind it and also where you're crushing the ore at the seabed because they've got to get it back up a mm. you know, four, five kilometre pipe back up to the surface. Um, they crush that at the seafloor uh, and then metals can oxidise that wouldn't other have been oxidised and then they can be toxic um, to the ecology and animals down there as well. So the plume's a big issue. Uh, early estimates are saying that could be about 100 kilometres radius big um, that that impact could be, but it's all very preliminary. Um, there's a lot of research going on into it at the moment. And also the physical removal of the hard substrate, so the stuff that the animals need to um, actually attach to. So that's not just at hydrothermal vents. Uh, there's also polymetallic nodules are another resource they're targeting. And we've, we've actually got some here. Mm. And um, I don't know if you'll be able to see on a camera before at all. These are very, very small nodules, probably not ones that would be of economic interest. But larger potato-sized lumps of these nodules tiny little corals and things called xenophyophores, like for foraminifera, um, they, and sponges, they attach to these nodules and are what we call obligate nodule dwellers. And mm. so they can only mm. exist on those nodules. Mm. So and these are from about 4,000 metres yeah. deep yeah. in the central Pacific, so seemingly very remote, but now you know, possible yeah. potentially to explore and to exploit yeah. those. Exactly, which makes it even more important that, that you guys are able to do your work and find out what, what's, what's living down yeah. there and what potential yeah, impact what, will one be. One of the things Anne was saying is the importance of the biological data in understanding mm. that. We talked about larval yeah. dispersal and what lives yeah. there and that how critical that is. Yeah. And it's really interesting. So mining is obviously one uh, impact that we are potentially having on the deep. Yes. Great question here from Cecile on Facebook. She's asking, do these animals suffer from pollution or climate change at all? Because they're, they're quite deep. They would seem to be quite remote. Yeah, they do. So, um, you know, it takes longer for the pollution to get there, but it gets there and it's already yeah. there. So uh, recent studies by some of our colleagues here, actually, um, in the past couple of years have found uh, microplastics in deep sea benthic organisms, the ones that live on the sea floor, mm -hmm. um, in quite high concentrations. Uh, the sediments themselves they found microplastics in. And every time you know we fly an ROV down there, and you know, I can probably speak for both of us, we see uh, cartons of uh, drinks and beer and um, cans of everything and plastic and all sorts of litter down there as well. We've seen boots and mm. all sorts of stuff, just like you'd see in a, in a pond, you know, a mm. lake on land. You, you see a lot of this down in the deep sea. It gets there eventually. Um, although, you know, the big plastic doesn't get down as much, it breaks up into smaller mm. and smaller parts, which is actually more dangerous because it gets into the animals. Mm -hmm. um, and climate change, 
Climate change is having an effect on the deep sea. Again, it's taken longer to get there because you know it's got to travel down the effects. Um, but yeah, it's the deep sea is a big carbon sink. Um, so you know, messing with the balance of it with anthrop anthropogenic activities could have an impact on on climate change, <coughs> increasing climate change potentially. But that's mm. something that a lot of people are studying at the moment. The ecosystem services that um, the deep sea gives to us um, as a human race. And we've got even more questions coming in, guys. Thank you very much. These are great. So we've got Jonathan on Facebook asking, what was the most unusual life form you've ever found in your research or in mm. your searches? Well, for, for me, I think it's still uh, our discovery of these bone-eating worms. Yeah. So um, <laughs> not related to hydrothermal vents, actually. Are they? They, they are, well, they're distantly related. So they're actually animals which are related to the tube worms we were, showing, we were looking at earlier. Uh, but then animals is basically evolved and adapted. I'm talking about adaptation, how deep sea animals have uh, adapted to weird environments. But Osidax, the bone-eating worm, uh, has evolved the adaptation to exclusively consume whale bones on the seafloor using this root system. So actually lands, a little larvae land on a whale bone and from a dead whale, because there's lots of whales die and they sink to the seafloor, uh, uh, and grow into these bizarre uh, worms which can actually uh, colonise them. Um, a whale, but whales and remains of whales on the seafloor, a really bizarre thing that we didn't know about until <laughs> very recently. Uh, an entirely new group of animals. So, so these deep sea discoveries are continuously throwing up really biological novelties, really things that we ha hadn't anticipated or didn't know about. And, you know, and Amber mentioned ecosystem services and things like that. And of course, people want to know, you know what's the value of these things mm -hmm. you know, to humanity. Uh, and actually, today, yesterday I was talking on the phone with a colleague in Norway who's looking into uh, the, the enzymes that those particular worms produce as they could be of a bio useful for degrading uh, fatty tissue uh, uh, in industrial applications. So it's, it's amazing, like weird things which come out of very pure, what appears to be very pure mm. scientific research. Uh, and it's very important to, to highlight yeah. that. Yeah. Who knows what we're going to find down there? Do we find many new species? Uh, well, yes, and actually, the, the, <laughs> All the, the, time. <laughs> the majority of the animals that we bring up are, are species new to science from the very deep water. Uh, even just today, actually, I was working on a, on a publication with colleagues from this area where you have these polymetallic nodules and we're trying to think up names for 20 or 30 new species. <laughs> uh, so, yes, yeah, it becomes quite a challenge. You name it after all your ex-professors as well who taught you. But they, they, uh, yeah, it's amazing, actually, just how, how many new things are there. It's astonishing. Yeah, I think a colleague actually worked out that in the first 25 years since their discovery for in 1977, I think it was an average of two new species every month mm. was described from hydrothermal mm. vents just in the first 25 yeah. years and we're still you know at those kind of levels kind of now I think every time we go down there if we keep yeah, having these, these expeditions. These big crabs only yeah. described a couple of years ago and uh, you know it's a, it's a big animal like with high abundance of a system mm. which we just didn't we didn't even know the, the ecosystem existed so yeah, yeah really <laughs> amazing. Uh, we've got another question uh, from uh, Ibrahimo on Facebook. Um, are there new species of microfossils there um, that can give us concepts of environments that we might never thought of? Do um, we find microfossils? Yeah, microfossils are really important in deep sea studies because they, they show a record of climate in the past. Mm. So uh, you, you do get a lot of expeditions out into the deep ocean uh, drilling into the sediments. So mm. although we're talking about vents today, if remember, most of our deep ocean is a big sedimentary basin, which effectively over millions of years is a sort of steady rain of, of particles, detritus, bits of dead animals, uh, bits of phytoplankton from mm. the surface. And it just builds up. So you have hundreds and hundreds of meters. Uh, and it's a record of past climate. And you can use microfossils, so things like little ostracods or foraminifera. I think Amber mentioned those earlier, these unusual uh, protists too to look back in past climate. You can measure the changes in the abundance and diversity mm. of them. And, and, and actually, that's one of our best clues as to past climate changes over hundreds of millions of years, actually, from the deep sea sediment record. Yeah, it's so it's, it's a good question. It's yeah. fanta fantastic. Love. Excellent question. Thank you. And one more from um, Cecile on Facebook. Would you say that human exploration is the biggest threat to the animals down there? Depends what you mean by human exploration. Mm. If we're exploring to get scientific answers, generally we're doing that so that we can kind of catalogue what's there because we don't know how to protect it unless we know what's there. So you don't know what you've lost, you know, if you don't know what was there in the first place. So I'd say, you know, with that's not it, that kind of exploring where you yeah. look and you take a couple of samples and things like that, or even the exploration for, for mining, it's, it's not necessarily, if done in the right way, a huge, huge impact. But when you move on to actual exploitation of the deep sea mm -hmm. um, and people going out there once they've done their exploration, 
then that can be a very, very big impact. And not just mining, but you've got deep sea fisheries and the trawling nets that go over these coral reefs I mentioned at the start, they're very fragile. They um, are nursery habitats. So the baby fish, the, the juvenile fish that are economically of interest to us will kind of grow up and hide within these uh, branches of coral to hide from predators and that's where they grow up and but they know that the big fish are the fishermen know that the big fish are going to be there and so if you kill all the coral then the babies mm -hmm. can't grow and it has impacts on us mm -hmm. it has impacts on the ecosystem a lot of fishermen are very on board with not touching those areas now a lot of them are closed areas and marine protected areas um, so yeah we I'd say human exploitation is a very, very big impact. Exploration, I think, is needed yeah. uh, to yeah. catalogue yeah. what life we yeah. have in the deep sea. I think, I think it's important to remember that the, you know, the threats are there and the threats are increasing, but that the deep sea is still a vast wilderness area, mm. which is um, relatively untouched you know, compared to the, yeah. the United Kingdom, which mm. is mostly farmland or, or, or cities or towns. So I, you need some kind of reality check, but also that wilderness is something to value you know, in its own intrinsic you know, pristine nature as as we value Antarctica or the Arctic ecosystem mm. for the fact that we ha they are areas which we haven't managed to uh, have huge effects on yet. So it's something to, to, to think about is that, it, you know, it is that wilderness and, and how we preserve that and mm. how we want to manage that. And, you know, Amber talked about this, these UN processes of mm. discussion and dialogue that we're all involved with. And it is a, it's an opportune moment now for to get broader society and public involvement in thinking about that. What do you want? What do, what do people want from the deep sea? You know, do, you, we, do we want to have some minerals and balance that against some wilderness areas and these sorts of things? Very difficult questions, but yeah. important it's most ones. Most importantly, it's the common heritage of mankind. Mm. Most of the deep sea lies in these international waters I was talking about, the area, international waters, and um, they are the common heritage of mankind. So it belongs to everyone equally. So everyone has a say as society and what happens to our deep oceans. And so I think that's the most important thing about, you know, mm. this wilderness, really. Absolutely. Big questions for all of us, guys. <laughs> <laughs> now, very quickly before we wrap up, what's next for, for the, the pair of you? What, what exciting expeditions yeah. have you got planned? Uh, well, we're, I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, together with some colleagues here, we've got an uh, expedition out. There are some hydrothermal vents on the north coast of Iceland in June next year. Uh, so we will do lots of social media and... Um, and promoting and, and we'll do, try and do some live things from there when that comes out. So yeah, for those who be sure to follow the museum deep sea feeds on Twitter and things for that. Uh, we'll be trying to find some new species of animals and also looking at how animals colonize a hydrothermal vent in real time, you know, and actually in terms of understanding adaptations of the animals genetically. Uh, and Amber, I think you've got a, hopefully got an expedition next yeah. year at the Pacific, I think. Yeah, yeah just finalised oh. today that I'm going, actually. It's so quite <laughs> exciting. I'll be going uh, next March uh, for 52 days in total. So over wow. a month and a half, I won't see land. So that's, that you know, exciting. we send yeah, a lot of time sat at a desk and going to conferences and then we get sent out into the, we looked at the ocean. We today, we were like, and I was like, is that long? Is yeah. It 52? <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, I think the longest I've ever done is 48 days. So yeah, so be, I yeah, you'll beat the record there. Thrown yeah. in at the deep end, if you excuse the pun. Yeah. But um, <laughs> that's in this large area called the Clarion Clipperton Zone, uh, which lies between Hawaii and Mexico in the Northeast Pacific. And it's an area about the size of Europe. Obviously, I'm not travelling over and sampling that entire <laughs> area, but we're going to a small area there. And that's where you find a lot of these polymetallic nodules that are of economic interest. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at the effect that collector vehicles for mining might have on the environment down there. And so that's why we need to be out there so long. It's actually a three month cruise in total. The first bit is they're doing the tests with the mining mm -hmm. vehicles, and then we're going out there to say, you know, I'm representing the NHM there. What, what's actually been affected there in the environment. Mm. So it's the first of its kind almost with nodules. So we're mm. quite yeah, excited about yeah, what we'll yeah, find. But it's a long time. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, the best of luck. And hopefully you'll come back and tell us all about it uh, when the expedition's over. Yeah. And we'll yeah. be tweeting about it as well at the yeah. time. So Does we'll be sending. So, yeah, keep an eye on our social media feeds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, sadly, we are out of time. Thank you both so much for coming down to talk to us today. It's been fascinating, as always. And thank you to our viewers as well for your very excellent questions. If we didn't get to answer your question live, don't worry, Amber and Adrian will be online for the next few minutes and we'll try to get through any of those questions that we didn't manage to answer. And do remember to join us again next time. We've got a very special episode for you. I'm going to take a day off and we're handing over the reins to you, our viewers. We're going to devote the episode to your questions entirely. So keep an eye on our social media feeds for updates on that one.
get your questions ready and we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.